Diver Anon here, I'm back with some more stories from my colleagues around the world. Please sit around the campfire and enjoy a good old fashioned thread they don't make M like they used to. Have you heard of the raptures of the deep few people have? 30 meters below the surface, water pressure alters the properties of gases within the human body. What was once harmless or vital begins to poison your mind. The deeper the depth, the deadlier the poison becomes. Symptoms include, impairment, euphoria, laughter, anxiety, hallucinations, hysteria, terror, and death. And yet, we still venture into these depths, risking our lives and minds. Delving into a place where the barrier between the mind and reality becomes thin. Those of us who return can bring with us only memories of that alien world beneath the waves. These are some of those memories. Tales from beyond the depths of madness. My first story of the night is not set in the depths of the ocean, but rather on the surface. This story was told to me by the captain of a ship I was on for research work. A good Aussie chap, he always had a good yarn or story to tell about life at sea. At the beginning of his career on the sea, he was the greenhorn on a commercial deep sea fishing trawler. They mostly caught black cod, though a lot of other fish got caught in the net and discarded. He said that the deeper you laid your nets, the stranger the things you'd pull to the surface would be. Beyond a certain depth the fish become inedible, their flesh transforming into a pale, gelatinous substance not long after reaching the surface. One night in particular it seems, this crew set their nets too deep. As the nets raise out of the water, dripping wet and filled with pale wriggling flesh it became apparent that something was wrong. The fish were screaming. The noise was unbearable, some of the crew ran below deck and the rest put in earplugs. After some debate, they opened up the net on the deck to examine the fish. The captain swore that when they did, he saw fish with human faces. Distorted, corpulent, distended bit unmistakably human. And they were screaming. Pale blobs of flesh with a drooping face, fleshy nose, and black eyes, wretchedly screaming in anger, pain, or hate. They were quickly thrown overboard and the crew fished in shallower waters from that point onward. The next story is one of my own. Those of you who have been in previous threads might recall me talking about this briefly. I was doing a mixed gas dive to the bottom which was 60 m at this part of the lake. Mostly I was just looking for valuables or other odds and ends that had ended up at the bottom of the lake. When I was a kid, I lost a tooth on a boat trip. I think that was when my fascination with the deep began. My mind fixated on the idea of my tooth, sinking to the murky bottom and lying there. Lost to the depths, forever. I enjoy finding those lost things and bringing them back to the surface. It's so rare that you can bring something tangible with you from the deep. On this particular day, I brought back with me something that was intangible, yet infinitely more valuable than any treasure. I still had over half my cylinder and was enjoying skimming over the lake floor, sifting through the sediment and whatever odds and ends had ended up there. Out of the blue I had a powerful intuition that I was being watched. I turned around and saw a man standing there behind me on the ocean floor. He smiled at me broadly and waved his hand. That's when I recognized him, in a sort of stilted shock. I was face to face with my dead father on the lake floor, 60 m below the surface. He pointed to my cylinder and said something, his face wrinkled with concern. Well, he tried to speak. When he opened his mouth, only bubbles came out and I couldn't understand what he was trying to say. He pointed again, directly at my oxygen regulator. It slowly dawned on me what was happening. My equipment was malfunctioning, giving me an improper mix of gases that at this depth, can result in raptures of the deep narcosis. At this point, I was aware of the fact that I was hallucinating. 
I should have started swimming back up immediately. But I couldn't. I had left so much unsaid to my father. He had died in a boating accident a few years before, and I hadn't ever really gotten over it. He was just there one moment and gone the next. I never said goodbye. You have certain regrets when someone dies, things left unsaid. I always mulled them over in my mind. I wish I'd said this. Why didn't I tell him that before I died and I finally had a chance to tell him those things? To have that goodbye. But I couldn't speak, because of the stupid rebreather in my mouth. I started to rip off my mask and rebreather so I could talk to him, but he grabbed my hand. I yanked against him and tried to pull off my mask, but he wouldn't let me. Frustrated, I screamed into my mask, bubbles floating up around me in a stream up to the surface. And then, I felt him pull me into a hug. The kind he used to give me when I was a little kid. And in that instant, I just knew that he understood. That he knew. That this was him saying goodbye. When the bubbles cleared, he was gone. I swam back up the surface, spent a few minutes at my safety stop and then surfaced. I know it wasn't real, that it couldn't possibly be real. Besides, I don't believe in ghosts. I know I didn't really see my father, or my father's ghost down there. It was probably a manifestation of my subconscious desire or some shit, I'm not a psychologist. Even still, it's hard for me to not want to believe that it was real in some small way, that my mind was more open in that state and he reached out. I'm not sure why. I guess it's just that. It felt like he was there. It felt like him. It felt so goddamn much like him. God. I miss him. This story is also one of my own. It happened in Hawaii during one of my many diving vacations. It's a damn beautiful place with great weather and even greater views underwater. While I can appreciate the dark, murky atmosphere at the bottom of a lake, there's definitely something enchanting about crystal clear water filled with colorful exotic fish. It's certainly much less frightening than any of my deep sea dives, especially the ones that involved me welding vital components for hours on end with even the smallest mistake having potentially devastating consequences. That however, does not mean that it was not dangerous. You are always in danger underwater, whether you realize it or not. It is not your how. You don't live there. You don't belong there and most importantly in the water, you are no longer the world's apex predator. You're in a much, much bigger pond. Keep that in mind if you ever go diving yourself, it might just save your life. Even a small thing could kill you. In this case, it was a moray eel. Now morays are known for being vicious. But most people don't know that they're also very intelligent. I like to call them sea demons due to their disturbing combination of cold intellect and raw aggression. If one bites you, the best way to get it to let go is to cave its skull in. Otherwise good luck getting it to let go. That in itself isn't unusual but when it's paired with an uncanny intellect it gets a little bit scary. This moray in particular was the king demon of all the sea demons. Not in size he was about average for an older moray. What placed him above all the others was his pure dickishness. He tried to fucking cut my oxygen lines. I felt something tug at them violently, and I spun around to be face and face with this fucking dickhead. I could just see how fucking smug he was. That stupid fucking face. He knew what he was doing. And I knew that he knew. And he knew that I knew. So I pull out my knife that I keep for defense against sharks and cutting myself free if I ever get loose and I show it to him. See, look. It's shiny. If I poke you with it, you die. He knew what that was too. He didn't seem worried, 
but he backed off a bit. I kept an eye on him the whole way back to shore. I swear the cunt performed the moray equivalent of flipping me off when he finally swam away as I was nearing the shore. Moral of the story morays are cunts, don't fuck around with them. Okay, all done with my own personal stories now. This next story is supposedly bona fide true taken from the journal of a now deceased biologist researcher. I haven't seen the pages of the journal myself, but I'm working on getting them sent to me if possible. I'll share them with you if I ever manage to get my hands on them. For now, enjoy an abridged version. Date unspecified. Just heard a sperm whale on the hydrophone very unusual for this area and time of year frequency a few hertz lower than normal possibly a new subspecies date unspecified pod is upset still hearing the sperm whale haven t seen marv today hope the old codger is okay date unspecified pod remains agitated second day in a row without a sighting of marv s scarred old dorsal Starting to get worried. Date unspecified. Heard Marv on the hydrophone today. Good to know the old man is okay. Date unspecified. Keep hearing Marv on the hydrophone. He sounds distressed. Pod is still agitated. Date unspecified. If this keeps up much longer I might dive and check up on him. Date unspecified. Pod is extremely agitated. Nudged me back to the surface when I tried to dive. Date unspecified. Illegible. Okay, I'm actually back this time. Here's the rest of the journal for those of you who were waiting. Date unspecified. I'm not sure if I should write this down. I feel like I'm losing my mind. What I saw couldn't have been real. Date unspecified. It's killing the salmon. It's not eating them, they just flow to the surface to rot. They're refusing to eat the dead salmon. Won't be long before they starve. Date unspecified. Motherfucker started singing again. Date unspecified. I guess I'm going down to try and deal with this thing. I don't think I'm crazy. I'm going to write down what happened on my last dive, in case something goes wrong. I used the hydrophone to roughly triangulate where Marv's calls were coming from. Check the depth, got my gear ready and dove. The pod kept nudging me back to the surface, but I kept swimming down and eventually they stopped, circling me from a distance and making odd, mournful noises I'd never heard an orca make before. I pressed on, determined to find Marv and get to the bottom of what was happening. Poor bastard. After a certain depth, the pod gave up trying to stop me and circled from above, crying out in their own odd way. I reached the bottom, but couldn't spot Marv immediately. I could hear him, but I couldn't spot his location. It sounded like he was right next to me, even though I couldn't see him. I figured at the time that it was the channel walls bouncing the sound around and continued to search. Eventually, I found him. He was floating, immobilized and trapped in some sort of strange translucent substance. He seemed unresponsive, but I could still hear him. It seemed impossible he could be alive after so long underwater, but he still seemed to be vocalizing took out my knife and tried to cut what I assumed at the time to be degraded plastic packaging of some sort. The instant my hand made contact, pain came ripping up my arm and pulsed through my entire body. I saw stars and when I came to, I was floating immobilized next to Marv. I tried moving, but I was completely paralyzed. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. Slowly. I felt the tendril that had wrapped around my arm begin to tug me downward. I frantically tried to turn my head and see what was below me, but I couldn't even move my eyes. It continued to tug me down at a snail's pace, 
turning my body with it. As the seafloor tilted into view, I realized something was horrible wrong. The seafloor was writhing, the sediment shifting and pulsating. As my view tilted further downward, I saw what the filament was pulling me down towards. Protruding out of the mass of writhing sand was what I can only describe as a massive CNNO of some sort, with bulbous protruding growths reaching up from the seafloor towards me. And inch by inch, I was being dragged towards it. I couldn't scream, I couldn't cry, I couldn't even close my eyes. All I could do is watch as this thing reeled me in like a fish. The fucker took its time. Either it was slow or it liked its food well marinated in fear. I'm sure there's worse ways to die, but this is probably pretty high up there. I was pulled in, inch by inch until it grasped me. I can still remember the sensation. Thousands of feelers pinching my arms and face, rough like sandpaper. Pulling me further in. I still couldn't move, but inside my head I was screaming. The mass pulled me further in with a rippling motion, each pulse pulling me farther and farther down. I think I accepted that I was dead somewhere around the time my head was completely pulled into the mass. All I could hear was the rough rasping of the thing as it rubbed against my mask, pulling me deeper into itself. I'm not sure if I blacked out or went catatonic after that, but when I came to I was floating freely in a cloud of murky sediment. All around me were the same bulbous, writhing feelers that had pulled me in, but disconnected and squirming alone, directionless. I took a second to orient myself and calm down, when something brushed past me in the water. If I wasn't still paralyzed I would have shit myself. It came again, a massive dark silhouette shooting through the water just above the seafloor. In its wake, I could see thousands of the strange bulbous feelers being pulled up off the seabed. That's when I heard it. The familiar, lovely call. It was Shay, and I quickly began to see several other familiar shapes as the rest of the pod joined her. They shot through the dark like torpedoes, making an odd clicking vocalization that I've never heard before. Strange filaments like the one that had grabbed me and Marv trailed upwards from the mass, but the whales gracefully ducked between them and continued to skim the ocean floor, kicking up clouds of sediment and thousands of individual feelers. Eventually, I felt Che and several of the others nudging me towards the surface. They even gave me time to decompress before pushing me up to the surface. It took about an hour of sitting on the surface, Shay gently nudging me and clicking in what I assume was concerned before I finally regained enough mobility to climb back into my boat. The old girl seemed pretty excited when I finally managed to flop inside. I guess whatever was down there didn't really appreciate having its lunch stolen, so now it seems to be killing the salmon. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I'll be damned if I let them starve. That was the last entry in the journal, and the writer is apparently missing deceased. Still trying to see if I can actually get my hands on the journal itself or some pictures of it, but the owner is a very odd person and is being uncooperative at the moment. I'm going to leave for a bit and maybe come back with some more stories later. Back again. This is another story from Frank, if you remember him from one of the earlier deep sea threads I posted in. In case you weren't in those threads, Frank was my diving instructor. Absolute legend, been around a while and seen lots of strange shit. He never told me exactly where when this took place, it's kind of irrelevant in any case. He was taking a group of new diver trainees out on a dive for their certification. Usually they start you out in shallow water, after a few dives they take you out somewhere deeper. Frank goes out into the ocean a ways to get you used to the sensation of being underwater and being unable to see the bottom. It's an important thing to get used to if you're a diver. There's lots of places where the shelf will become a sheer drop off for potentially hundreds of meters straight down into nothing but abyss. 
If you're not used to it, just seeing it can induce panic and terror in certain people. The deep does that to certain people, and I would recommend not becoming a diver if you have some sort of phobia or fear of deep water. Facing your fears is great and all, but having a panic attack while you are 40 m underwater is a bad idea. Frank said in people who got panic scared of deep open water were pretty common. Hell, I got pretty scared my first time. But he says there's another reaction he's seen. He's only seen it once, but he's heard of it from other diving instructors. The only way he could describe it is the call of the deep. They dropped into the water off the boat, and Frank could immediately tell something was off. This kid hung back from the group, staring down into the water. Frank tried to pull him back, but he shook off his arm and started swimming away. Straight down. Frank waited a second, then started after him. He caught up at about 30 m and grabbed at his leg. The kid looked back at him and smiled, then pushed away and continued going straight down. Frank followed him for a bit and tried to stop him again, but the guy just kept going further and further down. Eventually, Frank had to stop and let him go or risk dying himself. To this day, Frank says it is the most unnerving shit he's ever seen. What could possibly compel a man to just swim straight down into the ocean what did he think awaited him down there the kid's body was never found. The parents sued Frank but he was exonerated by the testimony of the other trainees who backed up his claims. Police chalked it up to the kid being suicidal, but I'm pretty sure there's a long list of better ways to kill yourself. And like I said, this isn't an isolated incident. No cause or motivation has ever been determined, and the reason for why these people swim to their deaths remains a mystery. Okay time for a repost. This is the first story I posted on here, figured some announce in this thread might have missed it. I was doing a recovery dive in a local lake for the police, some idiot kid who hadn't worn his life jacket while drinking on a party boat. It was deep enough to require mixed gas to avoid narcosis. I was following all the normal protocols, keeping in contact with my diving partner, watching my dive computer. It doesn't take long to get to the bottom, getting back up always takes much longer. Me and my partner split up to cover more ground because visibility was extremely low. It must have been about 5 minutes before I saw it. There was a human silhouette standing upright at the bottom of the lake. I swam closer and found a man, perfectly preserved without a sign of decay on his body. He was buried in silt up to his shins. It really looked like he could still be alive, or had only been dropped into the water a few moments ago. I tied a line to him and started to head back up to the surface so I could get the boat team to haul up the body. So I swim up, letting the line play out behind me until I reach my first safety stop. While I'm waiting for my body to decompress so I can head further up, I notice that the spool of line is still being pulled out even though I've stopped. It's completely taut and rolling out straight down at a blistering speed. It takes me about half a second to realize that my reel is about to run out and I'm about to be sucked down by the line. There's a good 900 plus feet on my line, and the speed it was being reeled out was so tremendous that as soon as I tried to grab it, my hand was split almost completely open to the bone. In retrospect that was a dumb thing to do, but it was just basic instinct to grab the rope and try to cut it with my knife. I get a sudden IQ boost and instead cut the straps holding the reel to my suit a few seconds before the line runs out and it vanishes into the murky water within about half a second. I feel as if the force of the whiplash alone would have been strong enough to break my back and kill me if I hadn't cut the straps. I'm pretty shaken at this point more shaken than I've been since I found my first dead kid. But still I manage to ascend slowly and take my safety spots despite the pain, fear, and of course all the blood leaking out of my hand. Good thing this was a fresh water dive, or I might have been in real trouble on my way up. 
Anyway, my knee-jerk reaction and what everyone else told me was that it was narcosis-fueled hallucinations. Divers see all sorts of shit when narcosis kicks in, I've heard stories of fish and squid with human faces, some guy swears he was face to face with Tulhu. My point is, narcosis is to an extent like temporarily being on DMT, and it can make you see some absolutely crazy shit. The thing I can't make sense of is how I got the cut on my hand. It's clearly from a rope, it's not clean enough to be from my knife or any other sharp object. The doctor even noted that I had friction burns all surrounding the cut. So what the fuck caused the cut if I was hallucinating and if I wasn't hallucinating, what the fuck could drag out a line that fast? What really keeps me up at night is that the guy was resting on the bottom of the lake, and my line was going straight down. So either he was pulled through the bottom of the lake, or something with incredible strength and speed grabbed my rope and was reeling me in like a fish. I'm not sure which is worse.